Percy and Mary felt that they had no choice but to succumb to this pressure and they were married. Soon after Percy and Mary married, they had their second child, Clara. But Clara didn't live long, and Mary sank into a depression that she probably never came out of. And she can't have been helped by the letter from her father, Godwin, following Clara's death. You should recognise that it is only persons of a very ordinary sort that sink long under a calamity of this nature. Then Mary had even more problems. On another trip round Europe, it became clear that Percy had fallen in love with Mary's half-sister, Claire. He wrote her a poem describing his thoughts of her each night that went to nurse the image of unfelt caresses till dim imagination just possesses. Percy seemed so convinced of his free love theories that he couldn't even understand why his wife was bothered about any of this. His attitudes were that of his poem that began True love in this differs from gold and clay, that to divide is not to take away. And in a sense, he's right. Certainly when you have a new kid, the fact that you love it doesn't mean you have any less love for your partner or your other kids. But whether this works in the real world is another matter. I don't suppose anyone really comes home and says, Hello, darling, had a nice day. Oh, he screwed the window cleaner. <laughs> well, he's done a good job. Of the windows, I mean. Then in 1819, while touring around Italy, their three-year-old son, William, caught malaria and died. And then came the most extraordinary disaster. Percy set off in a boat to meet a friend in Italy, despite the storms. And although he couldn't swim, he was fairly confident in his abilities, having said, I can steer a boat with one hand and read a book by Plato with the other. Which is handy. You end up upside down with your head crashing against a rock, but at least you can be sure you're really there. But in the storm, his boat capsized and Shelley drowned. Percy was eventually found when his body was washed up by the shore and his friends, including Byron, gave him a ceremonial cremation on the beach. One obituary said, Shelley, the writer of infidel poetry, has drowned. This episode compounded Mary's wretched existence and she must have felt that she'd experienced every possible tragedy. Shelley's heart survived his cremation, although there was a row about who got to keep it, and in the end Mary took it and kept it in her travelling desk for the rest of her life. She kept in touch with radical painters, and she did write several more stories, though mostly this was because Percy's father had cut off the inheritance and she needed the money. But by the time she moved to this house in Westminster, her revolutionary spirit was mostly broken by the string of disasters that she'd experienced. Not that there's necessarily a direct link between a writer's personality and their ability to write stories. Look at Geoffrey Archer, comes up with fantastic works of fiction. Then sits down to write a book, the ability deserts him. Eventually, Mary seemed to lose contact with all radical ideas. She became a supporter of Disraeli and condemned the revolutions across Europe. But she never fell out of love with Percy. In a reply to somebody asking if she would ever marry again, she wrote... Never. Mary Shelley shall be written on my tomb. Why, I cannot tell, except that it is so pretty a name, I never should have the heart to get rid of it. And that's what happened when, in 1851, she died. She had wanted to be buried next to her mother in St Pancras, under the ground where she'd first made love to Percy. And it would be lovely if we could all end up with a gesture like that. Though where I was brought up, that would mean digging up a lot of the toilets in Swanley School. Later, her daughter-in-law, Jane, who had married her son, Percy, saw the decline that the cemetery had fallen into and had their bodies exhumed and reburied in another cemetery in Bournemouth. But the rector refused to allow such heathens in his cemetery, so Jane turned up at the gates with the three bodies in a hearse and announced that she was staying until she could bury them, and the rector gave in. Even then, he refused to allow the word Frankenstein to appear on the tombstone or even to be spoken at the memorial, a decision that was upheld by the rector of the church in 1977. So as the rest of the establishment was panicking about punk, in Bournemouth they were trying to hold back the 1830s. Mary Shelley was writing at a time when for a woman to express ideas at all showed immense courage. Even today, if she was writing it, it would have to start... November, a cold, dreary day. I've created a monster, 
Me. I'm literally pouring out of my size 10 dress. I'm 32 and still no sign of marrying a tedious posh tosspot in publishing. Mary Shelley was an enthusiastic and passionate participant of the great debates of her age. She could look beyond the values of her own society. That's how she was able to write a simple monster tale that could encompass science, revolution, religion, philosophy, sexuality and the North Pole. So what would she say if she could see how widespread her legacy was today? Frankenstein is the name of the doctor, not the fucking monster! Charge up your mind with a visit to the Mark Steele Lectures website. Find it at open2.net.